able to empower other people. And it is the Sussex royal Meghan Markle who said that women do not need to be given a voice because we already have it. We only need to be encouraged to use it. And I'm very happy to be associated with this platform that creates that opportunity to encourage all of us to use our voice. And as I scan this room, I see many women, many men who support women, who I have grown to listen to their voice, to recognize their voice from near and afar. And on this high table, we have some of them. We have Madam Sarata, we have uh, Madam Kumba, and we have Madam Hannah Foster, who are going to give us a remark on strengthening women's voices in governance and in the broader society. Before we begin with Madam Kumba Sane, I want you all to give them a very big round of an applause for their continuous <laughs> contribution to women empowerment and for championing democ democracy and human rights. Uh, Madam Foster. Person of the occasion, uh, Madam Nima Kamara, uh, Madam Kumbasane, and um, my colleague at the high table, um, Madam Sarata from uh, GCCI. Religious and traditional leaders, uh, members of the press, and I also want to recognize Madam Daniel Ajiman from the wall movement. Members of the press, invited guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocols respectfully observed. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be here and to be afforded the opportunity to deliver a statement at the opening ceremony of this very important forum and timely forum on Women Deliver, with a focus on strengthening women's voices in governance and broader society. On behalf of the African Center for Democracy and Human Rights Studies, it is indeed my pleasure to be here and to welcome in particular the World Movement for Democracy once again as a member of the World Movement myself and an immediate past president of the Africa Democracy Forum. As you may know, let me um, say a little bit on the center. Uh, the African Center for Democracy and Human Rights Studies, based here in the Gambia, is an independent, non-profit, pan-African human rights organization initially established under the distinguished patronage of the former president, Sir Dauda Keira Bajawara, in 1989, by an act of the Gambian parliament. Its first governing council chairperson was the attorney general and minister of justice, then Honorable Hassan Bubakar Jalo. However, in 1995, the act was repealed and the center relaunched. The African Center facilitates the upholding and promotion of Article 25 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which supports state parties and other stakeholders to promote and ensure through teaching and education and publications respect of the rights and freedoms contained in the Charter. The African Center works in collaboration with all partners, state and non-state actors nationally, regionally, and globally in this endeavor. 
the African Center's mandate is guided by four pillars, governance, gender equality, conflict management, and the right to development, which is attained through advocacy, education and training, research and documentation, publications, and networking for human rights in Africa. Given our affiliation to regional and global movements, and as the convener of the Forum of NGOs in the work of the African Commission, we have witnessed various transitions in many countries around the world. Democracy is indeed a way, the way to go. However, it is not a straitjacket, and every nation has the responsibility to carve out their path, guided by the basic principles of justice, of human rights, the rule of law, participation, inclusion, among other things. The Arab Spring has given us impetus to many strains of democracy. Today, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt are still in the process of charting their own destinies and are providing vital lessons for us to learn. Moreover, we have seen the revolution of citizens standing up for human rights and being counted from the East to the West, Latin America to the South. The wind of democracy is blowing. The latest we saw was in Sudan. And today, as we speak, we are talking about even in the Gambia, no problem. These are exciting yet critical times for democracy, especially here in the Gambia, our motherland. Where are we? I asked myself. And uh, following the commitments of ECOWAS, let me remind us where we are coming from um, to physically remove the former president who lost at the ballot box from power with the ground forces. The stage was set for the installation of the democratically elected president, Adama Baro. The ECOWAS, under the presidency of Liberia and led by Alan Salif Johnson, had put its resources, its integrity, and reputation on the line to ensure that the Gambian people's voices, through their votes, were heard, and their dream of democracy taking its course was realized. ECOWAS has set a standard. It was the first of its kind to ensure the adherence to democratic outcome of an election and upholding the will of the people. A fit the Gambian population would not have been able to achieve without assistance. The swearing in of President Adama Barrow on January 19th, therefore, took place in an environment where expectations were very high. The Gambian people primarily, his peers regionally and globally, to say the least. Going forward, we have heard from the administration that good governance and human rights, security sector reform, and justice for victims of human rights violations would be important hallmarks to distinguish the Third Republic. Some of the basic facts about Gambia, just to remind ourselves, we are a population, a small population of 2 million people with a growth rate of 3.2% per annum. 63% of the population are under 25 years old. Poverty level is 46%. The literacy rate, we are talking about 55%, but when we look at our female literacy rate, it's only 47, that is those above um, 15 years old. More than half of the population live in urban areas. And we also see an, an equal distribution of population. Uh, there is also, um, it is a parliamentary democracy as we all know, and we are moving towards the third republic. A look at our framework will reveal that the 1997 constitution provided a framework for strengthening governance processes 
in the Gambia and address poverty reduction, sustainable development, etc. We do have various laws and policies to address different areas, and by that I am talking about Vision 2020, the Local Government and Finance Act, the National Governance Program, the Women's Act of 2010, uh, the National Development Plan, among others. The state of the Gambia is party to numerous international and regional instruments on various issues, including human rights and governance. However, the government has not signed, has signed but not ratified the African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Governance, and has not submitted itself to the African peer review mechanism. The state also has recently a backlog of outstanding reports to international and regional human rights bodies, which it has commenced to address. None known to the, to the African Commission since 94, but uh, hope, uh, we've seen the report submitted in 2018 and has been considered last year by the African Commission. We've also seen the government of the Gambia submit itself a report to the UPR, the Universal Peer Re um, Review at the national United Nations. The country had in the past suffered from lack of transparency and accountability, political instability, weak institutions, rampant corruption, impunity, among other ills. The current reforms are in an attempt to address gaps with a view to improving the socioeconomic development and political environment of the Gambia and promoting good governance, among other principles, are very welcome. The Gambia, therefore, is at a crucial stage in its democratic transition process, and expectations continue to be high. It is essential that these expectations are met and the authorities that deliver in terms of justice, social and political reforms, and development. A primary conclusion points to the need of the Gambian society to rebuild confidence and cohesion between its ethnic communities on one hand and in relation to the state institutions on the other hand, national cohesion and trust were severely corroded under the previous regime and there is need for a new sense of patriotism to be instilled in the people. Allow me to emphasize on the fact that in order for democracy to deliver, we as institutions, civil society organizations, private sector businesses need to come together. That we cannot look to government alone to solve our problems or to find all the remedies to our challenges. All the different sectors and individuals do have a role to play and in advancing the type of policies and reforms that lead to prosperous, safer, democratic societies. Talking on the essence of the uh, Wagadugu Declaration adopted in January last, uh, in 2018, there is recognition indeed of the role of governments as well as business, labor, and so civil society to promote a peaceful and inclusive society that promoting good democratic governance will in turn provide economic growth, political stability, development, and security. To come to the main uh, issue that has brought us together today, strengthening women's voices in governance and broader society in the Gambia. In the Gambia, while women comprise 56% of the electoral body, they are seriously underrepresented in elected and appointed bodies. With a female presence of only 7% in the National Assembly, they form less than 23% in local councils and about 17% at the level of the chief 
of the central executive. Gender rights, gender equality rights, present a challenge from multiple perspectives, ranging from deficit in political party participation and representation to a culture of marginalization of women and violations of their fundamental human rights. Moreover, women are discouraged to voice their problems and concerns and are exposed to the constant pressures of a patriarchal society. We must, however, note the importance of women's participation and accept that they must lead in the change in making democracy deliver. Women need to recognize the important role they play in these processes and be provided all the opportunities possible for the benefit of the communities as well as the nation. They need to be encouraged to get out of their comfort zones and reach across the different sectors to find mutual interest in advancing inclusive democratic process, policies and reforms that benefit us and our communities. And that leads me to um, the situation in leadership uh, that worldwide, when we look at uh, parliamentarians, we're looking at 24% that are women worldwide. And when you compare the 7% that Gambia is at, we need to pull up our, success, our socks. As advocates of gender equality in Africa, we cannot operate in prescriptions and approximations. Gap, gaps of gender inequality must be recorded so that a trail of implementation is clear and decision makers are held to account. According to a study by Plan International, many women and girls between 15 and 24 want to take up leadership at various levels, whether it is in the workplace, politics, and wider society. Yet, nine out of 10 believe that women leaders will suffer widespread discrimination and sexual harassment no matter where you come from, and your ability to contribute to change. In that study, 76%, a very high percentage, aspired to be leaders. We also saw that in that study, 60% were confident of their abilities to lead. Yet, 94% believe that being a leader, a woman leader, involved being unfairly treated compared to men. They also believed that 93% of female leaders experience unwanted physical contact. These are some of the challenges that we will have to address as we move towards women delivering. We want to see government efforts uh, complemented in this area. So some recommendations that I'm I want to share include policy changes. Yes, policy changes are taking place, but at a slow rate, we need to do more. Um, these changes are requisite for implementation of these reforms. However, we need to also consider building of capacity of private sector and civil society to enable them make informed choices and put input into policy making, especially the women in those areas, in the private sector, as well as in civil society. We also want to see the improvement of growth and economic development through the enhancement of networking and building strategic partnerships. Um, you will hear me repeating strategic partnerships, uh, talking about private and public partnerships and creating a dialogue mechanism is very crucial. Many times challenges occur, not because we do not have the solutions, but because we are not talking about it, there is no dialogue, and we are not even listening to each other. So I believe these are things that we will have to put on the table and put on our agenda as well. We need to reinforce that partnership 
between government and civil society. As you all know, there is a, a climate of mistrust that we need to mend if we want to ensure that national development is, up, um, is achieved. Capacity, capacity strengthening at all levels and across all sectors is also key. To conclude, I want to say that in spite of all the progress made to attain women's participation and representation, a lot more needs to be done. It is our collective responsibility uh, that we endeavor to, one, change the narrative. We need to change the narrative. Women are moving from vulnerability to being a change agents, agents of change and drivers of progress. Investment in women and girls impact positively on communities, on the nation, and on development. And above all, the achievement of the SDGs and Agenda 2063, the Gambia we want would eventually be meaning, making a meaningful contribution to the Africa we want. Two, we need to mobilize across sectors, engaging all sectors and generations towards this goal. Three, we need to create inspiring and results-based country actions. Like I said, democ implementing democracy is not a straitjacket, but we need to ensure that we carve it based on our own needs, based on our own situations. Madam Chairperson, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to redefine power as gender activists and recognize our ability to use power for the common good at every level. We should embrace the facts. In a gender equal world, we all stand to gain. We need to strengthen and uh, our investments and consolidate our gains. That is our political gains, our economic gains, social gains, call it what you may. And we need to break down structural power and all barriers to progress and attainment of, gen to the gen attainment of gender equality. Lastly, uh, the power of movements need to be embraced because in many times you find out that we are working in silos and building empires. It's not helpful. We need to be able to engage all sectors, across sectors, uh, uh, across generations, and the need to also uh, ensure that we use opportunities to advance gender equality causes. I would like to commend and to re the, uh, the organizers of this um, initiative, the wall movement, the CPDE, and the future in our hands. And uh, to also reiterate the African Center's commitment to accompany this process once we uh, agree on the way to go forward. I just wanted to share some outcomes of a study we did in the area of uh, women's political participation. We carried out a study on uh, political party manifestos and constitutions, uh, as well as looking at the 1997 constitution. What we found out was that in paper, on paper, everything looks very beautiful, but when it came to implementation, it's a different story. So, Ensuring that there's accountability, ensuring that there's implementation, is not the work, on, work of only civil society. All our hands must be on deck if we want women to deliver. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, one of them is mine. Hello, Madam Foster. Uh, I think we have my paper. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that brilliant uh, speech. 
first to acknowledge your presentation and the background of where we have come as a nation. The transition from a dictatorial regime to what we have today as democracy, but also the inevitability of the takeover of repressive regimes by democracy and good governance and the role that women and youth especially play in that. And the account that you have given on our state of democracy, the need for the civil society, the economic actors, the private sector, to all play their role, to embrace their role in this new dispensation, and the need for us to have the partnership that is required to advance women issues. Thank you very much again. Now I have the pleasure to hand over the mic to Madam Kumbasane, board chairperson, future in our hands. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. Religious leaders, representatives of the private sector and civil society, the press, members of the high table here present, Sarah Tokonate and Mrs. Hannah Foster, who just delivered that excellent speech about women and the history of human rights in, of this country. All protocols duly and respectfully observed. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to deliver a welcoming statement on behalf of the board, management, staff of Future in Our Hands, the Gambia, and my humble self at this very important conference on Women Deliver Forum. I wish to take this opportunity to welcome our collaborators, the World Movement for Democracy, in the passing of Ms. Daniel Ajimang. I hope I spelled the name correctly. I pronounced the name correctly, rather. And the CCP representative in the Gambia here, Mrs. Hannah Foster. For Ms. Hannah Foster, for collaborating with us to host this important conference at a very critical stage of our democratic process when the constitutional review process is being validated for enactment by the Gambia National Assembly. And the National Development Plan 2018 to 2021 is being currently operationalized, which really encompass the three thematic areas of this important f conference. Namely, one, policy advocacy and implementation of the Gambia National, Gambia's National Development Plan. Two, responsiveness, responsive governance of the Gambi in the Gambia in the areas of ethics, security, economic and political inclusion. Three, inclusive approaches to entrepreneurship and policy engagement. Finally, I wish to welcome our other partners and collaborators here present, MRC Holland, MOPSI, Future in Our Hand Sweden, in the passing of Christina, who's always behind us, supporting us in all our endeavors and the diverse group of intellectuals present here. I can see Serin Falunjai. Serin Falunjai is not a stranger here. And the um, Women's Bureau Director, and Mr. Bin Mrs. Binta Sidibe, Yame, and some other respected dignitaries and intellectuals here. Other participants, most especially, most especially women in leadership and decision-making process and our main folks in, this in the various disciplines of this conference. I thank you all and look forward to fruitful de de presentations, discussions, and recommendations at the end of this conference, which I ho hope will form a new chapter you know, towards um, 
the Gambia's development. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Madam Kumba, for welcoming and recognizing the personalities that we have here, but also the partners that we have continued to work with for women and for what we can do collectively and as individuals. Uh, now I will hand over the mic to Madam Sarata of GCCI to give her remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. My esteemed beautiful ladies on the high table today, Mrs. Hannah Foster and Mrs. Mam Kumbasane. Um, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed uh, members of the Gambi Chamber of Commerce especially, but also partners of the GCCI that I recognize today, um, GWCC President, Women's Bureau, uh, also strong partners uh, that I, I know we have a lot of potential that we can work with. Uh, I see the founder of Trezor Women Warriors uh, in our midst today, and we want to recognize uh, uh, GCCI Chief Executive. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my role today is the shortest amongst the three today. And my organization was chosen to be part of uh, the session for two very important reasons. Uh, there are two fundamental, two-pronged uh, objectives of today's session. Support to women and private, enter, private support to private uh, development in the Gambia. My organization is also known for its long-term and continuous and very successful support to women and development of women in the Gambia. At the same time, we are known for supporting an enabling environment for businesses to thrive and be successful in the Gambia. Um, today, I deliver very brief remarks on behalf of our partner since 2017, the Center for International Private Enterprise based in Washington, DC, a very strong partner of the GCCIs. If you know SIPE or if you don't know SIPE, the very morals and philosophy that, uh, is built, that SIPE is built on hinges on democracy, but the belief that private enterprise and free markets should thrive in order for democracy to be successful. And that is why we have partnered with SIPE since 2017 and continue to do so. Uh, just briefly, I will talk on our relationship and our partnership with SIPE, because I think it's very important for all of you to know. Um, from 2017 to date, we have been working on an establishment of a very important platform, a first ever platform in the Gambia, which is the National Business Council. And it is a private and public partnership uh, dialogue platform that comprises of uh, the government the highest uh, authority, as well as key business leaders within the business community. And within this uh, council, we have endeavored to continue to work together um, to ensure we have uh, private sector-led solutions uh, that will help us uh, collectively as a country to realize our goals, particularly through the National Development Plan. That is what we have been working on, and for that, uh, we're very honored uh, to have been chosen and identified by the World Movement Democracy to be here and deliver very brief remarks today on behalf, also on behalf of SIPE. Um, so on that note, we thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and continue to encourage particularly women to use their voice. As the chairperson just reminded us in the beginning of today's session, it is very important. It is important to hear what we have to say. It is important to uh, share our experiences so we know what each and every one of us can contribute. It is important to also know where we're heading to and how best we can collaborate. And that is very important. And this was also mentioned by Madam Hannah Foster. How important is it to know how we can collaborate together to be able to achieve our collective goals? 
Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, I thank you very much on that note. I'm moving over to my place. Um, thank you so much, Madam Sarata, for re-emphasizing the role of the market, especially in any democratic regime. It's as important a rhyme as the state institutions themselves. And partnership in this area is very crucial, as she points out, but also to encourage all of us to do our bit, to advance democratic values, good governance, women and children empowerment, but also to collaborate, to empower one another. So thank you so much, our speakers, as we take leave of you to continue with the rest of the program. I just have a small announcement. Can somebody help me with this? I have an announcement from the organizers. Since everything is digital and we want to be visible, it's not enough to speak. You want to reach an audience, right? And there's no better way to do it than Facebook and Twitter. Uh, so there is a hashtag that we would like to utilize called Sectors Together for Prosperity. Hashtag Sectors Together for Prosperity. The number four. So it's hashtag Sectors Together number four prosperity together. So if you are on Facebook or Twitter and you're posting about this event, we would like you to use this hashtag so that we can trend and we can be heard all over the world. Thank you so much, our speakers. So we are moving on to having our first panel. And the, the important speakers on this panel I would like to invite on the stage. First, we have Mr. Falunjai, Policy Advisor, President's Office. Please put your hands together for Mr. Falunjai. Second, I'm not sure if she's around, we have Mayor of Banju, Madam Rohi Malik Lo. I'm informed she's not around. Uh, can I invite on the stage Fatu Kinte, Minister of Women's Affairs, Children and Social Welfare. May I invite Madam Bintu Gasama, Executive Director of Women's Bureau. Please put your hands together for her. And finally, I would like to invite on stage Mr. Mohamed Selubah, National Coordinator uh, for Hopes of Tomorrow, who is equally the National Coordinator of Democratic Union, which is in partnership with IRI. Now, if you were here in 2016, you know it was a monumental period. It was an year that ushered in a change to a system that majority of us, the millennials, have had no experience of until that time. It was also a period that have ushered in a regime that we envision would be inclusive of all the actors in any democratic regime. And as a result of that change of government, we have had the national development plan that was developed by the new government, which recognizes the role of the civil society especially, and the economic actors whose collaboration is being sought 
to deliver the meaningful development that is both inclusive but beneficial to everybody in the country, but especially women. So as part of this panel, we are going to have presentations by our speakers on policy advocacy and implementation of the Gambia's National Development Plan. And if I may begin with uh, Ms. Bintu Gassama, or Mrs. Bintu Gassama, to give us the first presentation. Would you like to come to the podium? Or should I start again? So apparently there is a moderator to moderate this panel. So instead of her coming to the podium, I would hand these tools over to have the panel ongoing from here. Uh, Mohamed. Okay, um, thank you. My name is Mohamed Ba. Um, thank you for um, having me here, um, I'm moderating this panel discussion uh, with these very dignitaries. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, Mayor of Banjul and the Minister. Uh, probably she is um, enjoying her one year anniversary since she was appointed as a minister. So maybe she is celebrating it. So. Minister of Women Affairs. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the session basically is um, on policy advocacy and implementation of the Gambia's National Development Plan, uh, which started in 2018. It was launched in 2018 um, for 2018 to 2021. Uh, the discussion will focus on the ways in which government policy creation and impl implementation can enable good business and a democratic environment for its citizens. Uh, as I said, the National Development Plan was launched on the 6th of January 2018 by the President. Um, I <coughs> stole a quote from the President um, from his words, that is, successful implementation of the NDP will ensure achievement of government's medium-term development aspirations. It will also contribute to the realization of our global and regional commitments, such as the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and African Union, AU Agenda 263. Basically, just to give you a um, synopsis of the National Development Plan, the goal of the National Development Plan, as stipulated in the plan, is um, to deliver good governance and accountability, social cohesion, and national reconciliation. It aims to revitalize and transform the economy of the well-being of all Gambians, according to the NDP. The National Development Plan has eight priority areas. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the National Development Plan has eight priority areas. Um, uh, part of them is restoring good governance, respect for human rights, the rule of law, and empowering citizens through decentralization and local governance. It has uh, seven critical, um, cross-cutting critical enablers, uh, amongst which is 
uh, connecting it to this program, amongst which I chose two, which is empowering the Gambian women to realize her full potential, which is one of the critical enablers, and then uh, strengthening evidence-based policy planning and decision-making. Uh, this is part of the critical enablers. It has seven critical enablers. Now to my uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Falu Njai. Mr. Njai is the policy advisor of uh, the president's office. Um, Mr. Njai, I have some questions for you. Um, Mr. Njai, um, looking at the current realities on the energy um, sector, giving, which is very key in enhancing business, but it is still unstable and costly. What are some of the policies that government has developed or intend to develop to addressing this important sector? I believe these are the realities when we talk about enhancing business in the country. There is a problem in the energy sector which is definitely um, a critical actor in every sector. So that is my first question before I go to the next one. Mr. Njai. Um, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, good morning, everybody. And um, let me say a very big thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this very, very important discussion on the National Development Plan. Um, moderator, if I would just go straight to your question on the issue of energy. Energy is an important aspect of the National Development Plan, as you know, and one of the key priorities of the NDP is actually to address the, the issue of, um, of energy. Um, but then as far as the policies on energy are concerned, there are a number of issues. One is, of course, at the time that um, this government came into being, energy was one of the very, very key issues that needed orient attention. So the initial focus was how do we improve the issue of energy supply? Um, of course, there is the new energy policy that's being developed. But in the interim, they had to look at measures to make sure that there was improvement in the supply of um, electricity. Hence, you had CAPO and um, a number of other things. And I think citizens would realize that the energy uh, issue of supply of energy has greatly improved. Of course, I'm not a technical person, but I do know that, I mean, in meetings with the Ministry from Energy, some of the things they talk about is that now the issue of energy it's not an issue of supply. We have more supply than demand. It's an issue of what they call um, distribution, and um, there's a term that they use for it, the issue of distribution. But over the long term, we are looking at also how to make, I mean, clean energy. Because, I mean, a lot of our, well, not a lot, but almost our entire energy supply is based on, is being generated. So there's need to look at, I mean, clean and renewable energy. And there are a number of programs in the, in, in the pipeline on, on that. Because at the end of the day, we all know the effect of climate change um, on, 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 uh, on, on, on the planet. Therefore, as we strive to improve our energy supply, it is also important that we look at alternative sources of energy, more cleaner energy, either um, using solar or wind, or other forms that are uh, much, much, much better. So for now, this is what I can see about I mean, the issue of energy. Um, obviously, there is a policy by government to ensure that there is improved electricity supply, to ensure that there is, well, when I talk about improvement, that's those who already have it, but also there is expansion of um, electricity to all areas um, in the country. Right now, I'm involved in two things which I may just go through very quickly. One is what is called willingness to pay. Because um, 
Yes, everybody needs energy. Everybody wants electricity. But then the issue of affordability is something that we need to look at. So we're currently involved in a study where NAWEC and um, I mean some other partners are looking at if energy is expanded to some areas, some places in the rural areas, are people willing to pay for the services? Because as we say, there's no free lunch. I remember those days when I was a field worker and I was in Caravan and um, electricity was being uh, you know, installed in Caravan. There was a big fight amongst the body bunkers who gets electricity, I mean, who gets a meter. But the day the bills started coming, people said, well, come and take your meter. I don't want it. Because they actually realized that it is not as, <laughs> I mean, they, they couldn't afford it. So the issue of affordability is something that needs to be looked at um, very, very carefully. So this is one. The other one also is we are also involved in uh, a pilot program. Um, those of you who are familiar with Senegal, Senegal Emerza, they have a program called PUDC. Here we call it PAC, the Program for Accelerated Community Development. There also we're looking at how best we can expand electricity to as many rural communities as possible. For now, it is being piloted mainly in the North Bank, and the reason for that is we already have this supply, you know, the agreement with Senegal, of which there is 10 megawatts, but only three megawatts is being used at the moment. So we're looking at how best to expand availability to these people because you don't have to buy generators or whatever, you just connect them to the existing grid. In addition also, there is there are plans to do a 4.5 megawatt uh, plant based on which will be solar. So there are all these things that are happening to expand electricity because we know electricity transforms lives. If you look at rural areas that have had electricity in the recent past, you would see how that I mean availability of electricity has enabled the um, sudden um, sort of I wouldn't say springing up, but bringing the town to life. A lot of industries are coming up. I have seen people from the rural areas who were here, welders and others who have gone back to their communities because there is electricity and started working from there. So it is an important part, uh, aspect of development, really. And maybe I'll stop here um, and wait for something. Um, thank you very much. Um, Okay, uh, Mr. Njai, um, looking at uh, um, women issues as critical issues in the Gambia, uh, we've observed that probably there are certain instruments that are in place um, to enhance or promote women uh, uh, development in the Gambia. However, uh, the social welfare component um, is definitely uh, lacking women and children, um, looking at the health issues, issues of health, issues of sanitation, issues of old age, issues of um, security, issues of um, child beggars, child labor, you know, young women being trafficked um, due to decent wages, lack of decent wages, and unemployment. And uh, we've also seen uh, young ladies in the Gambia, uh, most of them are returnees and are here, uh, frustrated in the country. Um, what are some of the, what are some of the policies that, uh, as an advisor to the president, what are the, some of the policies that you intend or already having in place to ensure that these issues are addressed. Um, thank you once again. Um, I, I think here now I'll go on to the NDP to talk about some of the key issues that um, do enhance um, or empower women. Now, which the National Development Plan we know there are two or three issues that are very much focused on women. One is amongst the priorities, women's empowerment is, 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 is one of them. The other also is the issue of harnessing the demographic dividend. 
Now, when we talk about the demographic dividend, we're talking about the young people. But as I always say, it's just like in a business. If you don't invest, you don't expect to receive a dividend. So if we want to harness the demographic dividend, we must invest in young people. And this is very, very key. So in the NDP, therefore, it is very, very, uh, it does realize the important role that young people have to play. And this is both men and women. But talking specifically about the women, empowering women is key to development. And um, so therefore, as part of the NDP, there is the issue of how do we ensure that women play a very, very key role in, 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 in the national development process. Maybe um, the colleague from the Women's Bureau will talk a little bit more about this, but I just want to say uh, for this purpose that there are a number of things that we need to look at um, as far as these issues are concerned. There are a number of reforms that are happening. Um, the civil service reform, the social sector reform, the electoral reform, the review of the local government act, etc. And do all this need to be looked at from a gender perspective. You know, when we look at reforms in the civil, uh, in the security sector, it affects men and women differently. So therefore, these reforms may take that into consideration. When we look at reforms in the electoral system, we need to look at how these reforms can really empower women. And I am one of those who very much advocate for what is called affirmative action, because I have worked in it, I mean, and maybe those of you who do not know me, I worked with the UN system in the past 10 years, and I've worked on affirmative action in the number of countries in the continent. And I believe the coming up of the new constitution gives us a unique opportunity to address this issue. I have said it in public, not once, not twice. I believe we need to do away with nominated members of parliament and replace it with women's representation at the level of the LGA. This is something that I always tell our women folk we must fight for. We have five nominated members. Do away with them and have one, a one woman representative in each of the eight local governments, then it doesn't have much budgetary implication on the number of representatives in the National Assembly. And I do hope the women folk are going to fight for this. Let us have affirmative action in this country. We are one of the very few countries that don't have it, and I believe we need to, and we have the opportunity to do so. Women are saying 30%, and you are saying one from each. That is seven, huh? <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, finally, uh, to Mr. Njai, uh, part of the, part of the um, critical enablers in the NDP is um, ensuring that um, you have a, an evidence-driven based policy. And we've seen over the years, Gambian policies, uh, probably quote unquote, uh, what people say is copy and paste. Uh, you know, it's not based on research, it's not based on evidence base. Um, how are you ensuring that uh, women are involved in your policies uh, that you are making towards issues that are affecting them. Uh, what are your plans, if you have any plans? What are concrete decisions that you've taken um, on that, uh, uh, in that regard? Um, thank you. Um, of course, you were right. Um, one of the, uh, the critical enablers for the NDP is evidence-based policy making. Now, when we talk about evidence-based policymaking, it refers to ensuring that our policies are informed by adequate, timely data. So in this regard, what government is doing is coming up with what is called an NSDS, National Strategy for the Development of Statistics. Now, when we talk about NSDS, it doesn't just talk about the Bureau of Statistics. It talks about 
all the institutions that are involved in either generating statistics or using statistics. So this involves strengthening, the, uh, of course, the uh, national, the Bureau of Statistics, the Gambia Bureau of Statistics, but also strengthening the capacity of the planning units in the various ministries and departments. Again, going back to the NDP and the um, Sustainable Development Goals, the data needs are such that you need, we talk about moving away from averages, moving away from global figures, to actually look at data that is as disaggregated as possible. So disaggregation of data, particularly by gender, it's the starting point. But then we are faced with challenges. We talk about poverty, and where basically the means of measurement of poverty in this country is through the integrated household surveys, through what is called a consumption approach. But that is at the level of the household. So when we say 25 or 30% of people are poor, what it actually means is that 25 or 30% of households are poor. But then we don't have the methodology to go in depth into that household to see who is poor, how many are men, how many are women. So that level of disaggregation is one of the key challenges is we have and is one of the key things that we really need to look at at all levels. Again, some of the internationally, uh, why, what we call IADGs, the Internationally Agreed Development uh, Goals, like the SDGs, you know, talk about this issue of leaving no one behind. Now, when we talk about leaving no one behind, it means we have to begin to target individuals wherever they are. Whether we are talking about social protection or whether we are talking about other things, it is important that we, are, we don't leave anybody behind. And for you to know that, you've got to know who the people are, where they are, why they are left behind, what are the issues that are affecting them. Then you can look at programs on how to bring them I mean, on, on board. So the issue of data um, is very, very critical. And I think everybody in this country knows that data is one of the very, very key issues we have as far as development is concerned. And if you don't have the data, you are not able to measure your progress, then also you are not able to formulate the appropriate policies to address your issues because you really don't know where you are. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I'll now come to uh, Bintu Kasama uh, from the Women's Bureau. Um, Madam Gassama, um, as a key institution, um, I am sure you are aware of issues affecting women ranging from scared resources, leadership, and less opportunities available for women. Uh, we also uh, know that uh, these are issues definitely uh, that are retarding women, development of women in this country. Um, what are some of the initiatives that you have currently, or what are some of the things that, you, the ongoing things that you have towards the development of women, starting from there? Um, thank you very much, um, um, Mr. Mohamed Ba, for the wonderful moderation. Nice, uh, my colleague here, Mr. Falunjai, and uh, I want to recognize the presence of all of my colleagues here um, in the hall. But I also want to thank very much um, the organizers, especially feature in our hands with their colleagues for organizing this very important forum. Um, this is all about women empowerment. If I look around, I see a lot of women here, and I know these are women who have voices. Um, Madam Kamara has said it um, here that it's not that women do not have voices. All women do have voices, but because we have different opportunities and different exposures, um, some of us can come out, you know, and make our voices heard. But some of us will need a little bit of a push 
from either our colleagues, from government, from NGOs, from the private sector to ensure that their voices are heard. And I'm really um, happy that uh, we have all these three groups in this hall here. We have the private sector, we have the NGOs, and we have government. This is the essence of public-private partnership. The government will play its role in terms of providing the policy guidance and the, the monitoring and the oversight role. But the NGOs and the uh, private sector also have a role to play to complement government efforts by implementing the policies government uh, developing. Um, so coming to the initiatives, some of the initiatives, maybe I will just give a little background to the initiatives that have been put in place since the Beijing Conference in 1995, uh, when the issues of women were of concern to all government, to the United Nations, to all partners, that um, we need to do something because we cannot develop without women. If we have more than 50% of the world's population left behind, we are not going anywhere in terms of education, in terms of health. You talked about energy, you talked about the environment. You know, women have a very important role to play in every aspect of our life. And so it is really, really important to ensure that there is gender equality and equity so that um, we get to where we really want to be. Um, so from Beijing, in 1995, the Gambia had several initiatives. I will just go through them uh, briefly. And that was the establishment of the, the creation of the National Women's Council and also the Women's Bureau. And uh, there was a policy um, 1990 to 2010, the women's policy. The, 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 it was not a gender policy, actually. It's the national policy for the advancement of Gambian women. And because we know that women are really, really left behind in all areas. And that was why the policy then was women focused. And after 10 years, that policy was, um, was uh, reviewed and there was a need to come up with a new policy because um, there has been some achievements in terms of women empowerment. So we said, okay, no, um, we don't only concentrate on women. Ms. Senjai has said it, we need affirmative action. A lot of uh, affirmative actions at some point were put in place, and that's why the first policy was focused on women. So we came up with a gender and women empowerment policy. We have a gender dimension, and we still have a women empowerment policy because we have some unfinished business with women empowerment. Women are still behind in terms of decision making, in terms of education, health issues, the environment, a lot of issues that are affecting women in agriculture. So um, we said, okay, let's have a gender policy, but let's have an affirmative action to come up with a women empowerment dimension, and that's why we call it a gender and women empowerment policy. And we've implemented that, and it's 10 years now. But also with the coming of the new government, um, there are a lot of reforms that took place, and part of that reform is the uh, uh, establishment of um, a ministry a standalone ministry for women, children, and social welfare. We know that there was a ministry of women's affairs, which was under the office of the vice president. Um, most of the time, these are some of the issues why uh, women's issues, you know, are not fully considered because, you know, they are always put alongside something else. But then uh, with the coming of the new ministry and the development of the NDP, um, I will just give um, a little background to that also when the, the, the consultant was going around, you know, having some consultations with key institutions, uh, we had a discussion with him and we said, we really need um, gender issues to come out in the national development plan. If we can have it as a standalone, we want gender issues to be mainstream in all part of the, um, the national development plan. And so uh, from the eight um, priority areas, and the seven critical enablers, gender is uh, one of them. But then we establish a gender reference group to really work on the national development plan. So we, 
we are practically going around to every group that was set up to develop the national uh, development plan. Like we, 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 we had a discussion with education, we had a discussion with the health group, agriculture group. So we were going around to ensure that gender issues, women issues in particular, are really effectively mainstream in all aspects of the national um, the development plan. And with the um, gender being a critical enabler means no particular institution can achieve its objective of the national development plan without really mainstreaming gender issues. So that is how uh, we have gender as a critical enabler in the national development plan and women's empowerment stood out very well in this. So with the um, establishment of the new ministry and an appointment of a minister, unfortunately she's not with us here today. She would have loved to be here, but you know there are other pressing issues, so we had to divide ourselves um, for someone to be there. Both of us cannot be here at the same time. We are a new ministry, we're still developing. So the new ministry um, has come up with a strategic plan. We have developed a strategic plan, and the development of that strategic plan has just been concluded, and uh, it was validated last week. I'm sure some of you were part of the validation, and critical issues were incorporated in that um, strategic plan to give the ministry a direction to ensure that the issues of women, children, the issues of people living with disability, all the uh, issues that you have mentioned here, issues of poverty, issues of social welfare, leadership, yes, leadership, those are all critical issues that have been taken care of in the, um, in the strategic plan. But with the um, gender policy, 2010-2020, uh, 2020, coming to an end, we have also sought the support of our partners to come up with a new policy. There was a midterm review which revealed that we really have to come up with a new policy to take care of emerging issues. You know, gender issues, there are emerging issues all the time, and some of these issues might not have been taken care of in the old policy, so we are coming up with a new policy starting from 2021 to 2030. And very soon, consultations will begin, and we will uh, be going around, you know, the whole country um, to consult with people in all walks of life at um, regional level and also at national level to give the policy the ownership that it requires. The people need to own the process. So that is why we are going to have this national consultation. So very soon we will start. Probably next week we will call some of you to the office, um, some key institutions um, as technical experts to come and discuss the format of the policy. We don't want to do it at our level. We want everybody to be involved. So we are going to do that next week, inshallah, on the 4th of Jan uh, March. Um, so this is what we are doing. But um, apart from that, we, we, we have other things in place to protect the rights of women, to ensure that women participate in politics. Um, during the development of this, um, the, the <laughs> no, 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 not the strategy, the, 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 the national, the, the constitution, the constitution of the Gambia, um, we had several consultations with partners. We had a gender paper, a position paper on gender. We had two uh, retreats, one at Kanilai, we had another one at Action 8, to ensure that women's issues, especially women's participation in decision making are really taken care of in the constitution. And from the draft, we have seen that uh, there, are, there is a provision for reserve seats for women, 14 reserve seats for women. And well, for a start, we think that is okay because in addition to the reserve seats, as we said, there are women who have voices and we know they will come out and uh, really contest the election. Thank you. Uh, we're hoping that, <laughs> yeah, it will happen. Okay. Um, 
before we go to the questions and answer session, uh, Madam Kasama, uh, what are some of the challenges and that obviously um, you encounter um, at your side as an institution and also at the um, when it comes to uh, addressing issues of women, uh, women themselves, and then what is the way forward? Thank you very much. Um, um, for women's empowerment, for gender equality, for women's participation in decision making in politics, there are several challenges. Uh, there are several barriers to women's empowerment, and uh, these barriers uh, range from cultural, social, socioeconomic, cultural, and um, political barriers, and also issues of discrimination against women, stereotypes. These are all issues that uh, affect women. When we come to women's participation in politics, um, I think this is really important. Uh, economic empowerment of women and the participation of women in decision making in all areas. We know women have agencies and um, these agencies can enable women to make effective and informed decisions that will transform their lives for better outcomes. But then women have so many roles to play that it um, sometimes minimizes their ability to participate. Not decision making at um, just at national assembly level, at cabinet, but at local levels also. Even at the household level, it's very important for the woman to be able to take part in decision making, to be able to decide on what she wants to do with her life what happens to their children, the children in the household, what happens in the community, women should be able to take part. And if women are encouraged to take part in these things, their voices will automatically be heard. And these are some of the issues, cultural issues. Um, women have triple roles also to play. And these triple roles are so important to women that you know they don't want to leave it for anything, especially their reproductive rule. Women would rather see their children happy. They would rather see food on the table than go and attend a political meeting at the Bantaba. So that is one thing that is um, preventing women from realizing their full potential when it comes to political decision making. You can only realize your, uh, your potential when you participate. If you're not participating, if the space is not created for you to participate, it's always a problem for you to really realize your potential. But also there is, an, there is this issue of education. Women do not have the opportunity to be educated as well as men. If you look at the Gambia, uh, more than 50% of the women are not educated. And that is a cause for concern. You look at the health issues. When you look at uh, the maternal health side, Although there are achievements, but we still, the rate of maternal mortality in the Gambia is still unacceptable. We don't want to see a single maternal death. You cannot, we, we don't want to see somebody dying for giving life. You, that's, that's not acceptable. So 433 or 43 per 100,000 life births, that's not acceptable. We don't even want to have one. So that do, these are some of the issues that are uh, preventing women from realizing their potential. We have the issue of agriculture. More than 75% of the productive labor force is, is given by women in the area of agriculture. You come to the informal sector. It's the women. Why can't we formalize the informal sector? Why can't we give the women the, 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 the ability to improve their production and productivity? I will give you an example. You have one man cultivating, for example, just two hectares of land, and you have 10 women on maybe 10 hectares of land. At the end of the day, after the harvest, that one man will harvest more than the 
understand women. Why? Because the woman does not have access to the productive resources, not just, um, let's say, the, the land, but the type of land. What type of land do they have access to? Is the land fertile? What is the location of the land? Do they have access to input? So these are some of the issues. Just yeah. Yeah. You, you want to add yeah, something to that? Yeah. 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 Before you go, um, I, I want to just I'll give you the chance to talk. Um, I want to uh, basically, uh, uh, Mr. Advisor, uh, before we go to the floor, um, ask you uh, what sort of policies uh, we've heard uh, Madam Gassama have said, some of the challenges that uh, women face when it comes to agriculture. You know, uh, they are involved in gardening, if you go all over, but uh, women are still struggling. They are toiling endlessly. Uh, just to get and Smith. Um, women are also doing entrepreneurship. Uh, you see women in the morning when you go, you see, first thing you see, women carrying their uh, pans and other stuffs, going uh, and selling, trying to get something. Uh, do you have sort of policies to enhance those efforts to ensure that what women are doing or to create that enabling environment to ensure that women are also productive in whatever they are doing. Yes, um, thank you, moderator. Um, I think that's something that's very, very crucial and critical. Uh, as he has said, when we were formulating the NDP, of course, we did realize the important role that gender you know, um, plays, and um, this is why empowerment of women was put in as a critical enabler for the NDP. Now, that, what that means is that you, it helps you realize your potential. It helps you realize what you want to do. So in addition to having a specific program or component on gender, there was also the deliberate attempt that was made to ensure that gender was mainstream in all components. There were working groups, what we call SWD, sector working groups. And as he said, there was a gender reference group that worked with each of the sector working groups to ensure that gender was adequately mainstream into what they were doing. The agriculture or ANR, which was agriculture and natural resources working group, they met with them and ensured that all programs, priority projects for agriculture took into account the needs of women as well likewise the education sector working group and all working groups. So gender was, of course, I mean, standalone program, but at the same time, mainstream into all, all the other aspects. Um, if I may use, take, uh, use this opportunity just to say a little bit more about the issue of the challenges we are being faced with. There was something that she mentioned on the issue of education. But I think it goes a little bit beyond education to overall information. Because you need to know about things for you to be able to engage and participate in it. And one of the critical things we are faced with in this country is therefore is the issue of information sharing. Because a lot of us tend to work in silos. A lot of us see ourselves as, I am an agriculturist or I am an educationist. This is my area of expertise. It is for me to you know, develop these policies, which is one of our biggest problems here. Because we know whatever happens in education is very much affected by what happens in health, what happens in agriculture, what happens in other places. So information sharing, working together in partnership, collaborating in the issue of, uh, in the policy process is very, very key. The other thing also is this whole issue which I talked about before, working in silos. I think we need to embrace this new development paradigm that there's a very strong linkage between development, peace and security, and human rights. I think um, Mrs. Hannah Foster um, talk, mentioned uh, this in her speech this morning. As Kofi Annan used to say, there can be no peace without development and no development without peace. So what we call the development um, human rights and um, peace nexus. I mean, it is a triangle that has these three, 
development on one edge, peace on the other, and human rights on the other. And the country has a unique advantage now to ensure that these three are addressed together. We cannot have peace without development. You cannot have peace when human rights are not being I mean, adhered to. So this nexus we need to look at very, very seriously. As they say, a hungry man is an angry man, or a hungry woman is an angry woman. Peace cannot have, peace cannot prevail in the absence of uh, development. Human rights have to be observed if we want peace. So this is something that we need to look at, and it is for all of us from the various sectors to come together and realize that. The government together with the UN, this is what was called a conflict and development analysis, a CDA recently. And it was found out that a lot of the drivers of conflict are development related. So therefore, if we want to have peace in this country, if we want to ensure that we live in unison and harmony, we have to make sure that we also pursue development. I mean, all this to you all together. I just wanted to add that. Okay. Uh, Okay, um, thank you very much, um, my panelists, and thank you so much for that wonderful deliberation. Um, I would like, I would uh, now love to um, open the floor for questions and interactions. Yeah, probably someone can help with the microphone. Okay, oh, ex director. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And I would like to really seize the opportunity to thank the panelists and for the organizers and for everyone. Um, my question is to Mr. Falunjai regarding the policy and regarding the National Development Plan. First, when we are asked the question, energy, as soon as it came, I was saying, we are talking about women. What has energy got to do with women? And then quickly, my other mind came back and said, no, energy is more for women than for anybody else, considering our situation here. And um, with the energy policy, you talked about affordability, and you talked about accessibility. But I think energy, especially when we are talking about women, energy should be affordable, and it should be accessible to, to the women. In fact, if you want to stop even the rural urban drift coming, the women in the informal sector, they need the energy. Those, you know, those are the low level. They need energy to make their eyes and their wonder to sell. Where is the energy? And Mrs. Hannah Foster talked about the gender-based violence, sexual harassment. The people selling their staff, they need energy in the streets in order to avoid, because some, sometimes you pass 12 o'clock midnight, it's 1 o'clock. Even at the, you see women selling in dark places. <laughs> so that energy policy is very important, especially when we talked about 75% or 70% of our women are in the informal sector. And it's good that we have brought in the private sector. How many women are in the formal sector? The civil service, how many, the percentage, you all know. And even the NGOs we are talking about, the majority of the women are in the informal sector. So that energy, Mr. Policy advisor, I think we should revisit it. And for policies as well, I think policies should be monitored. We should ensure that policies are implemented. To, to tell you the truth, Mr. Jai, today I'm not going to talk to my director, but it's all about the policy, because that's where everything starts. We, we, we talked about affirmative action. What are we doing since the NDP came into being? What affirmative action have we taken? You, the ministries are under the office of the president, the executive. Even we say women at the decision-making level. You see the boards. I always watch. You say, put your gender lens on. You watch the TV. Just recently, the Ministry of Works, they created three boards. I was devastated. We have, we have only one woman in each of these boards. Where is the 30%? Where is the affirmative action? It's not there. It's lip service. It's lip service. We are not really moving. And we have been talking about this gender for the past 30 years. People like us, 
But since 1978, I've, I graduated from university, I've been here. We've been going all around the country, talking to government to government. It's still the same. When we had the parliamentary election, the TV came to my house. And they said, what happened? We had 19 women who came out. How many did we have? Only three. I said, it's, it's not anywhere. And the government must ensure, through the IEC, political parties, they must have women in the, as leaders. If they don't have women, all, all these political parties, they are all men. Only if you have deputy uh, party leaders. So the, there is so much lip service, and there is, um, there is not much commitment. And the Beijing Plus that we are talking about in 19, what did it say? The slogan is from commitment to action. We must see action, and us, the women, we must stand up, really. We have our voices, but we must show, make sure that our voices are heard and implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think we should um, welcome the questions, and then later, maybe one or two, three people. Uh, Jauno. Jaune. Jaune is over there. We will mix it, men and women, yeah, please. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. My question is directed to the Executive Director of Women's Bureau. I'm happy that you mentioned the challenges that women are facing when it's come to their businesses and their work, especially on the farms and all other things. Um, Recently, we've seen the National Assembly ratified a financing agreement of 47 million US dollars. I stand to be corrected, the honorable member is here. To support the creation and establishment of 40 women CAFOs, six new cooperatives, and 240 youth led businesses. I want to know whether your department, being that very important department, is involved, and at what stage are you involved in the execution of this very important project? Now that you've identified the problems that women are facing, I will be interested in knowing the role and involvement of your department in the execution of this very important project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a lady, please. A lady. Then they will answer, then we take the other set of questions. A lady. Okay, over there. Yeah. Um, thank you. I don't know if mine is really a question or actually a statement. When um, I think the gentleman from the office of the president spoke about how development is linked to um, peace. I think one of the things that we don't really speak about is the corruption that is really putting behind development, whether it's women's development or the development of the country as a whole, um, and the lack of accountability that is um, at the forefront of our leadership. I think that if we really want to develop women, um, there's been so much money that's come in since 2016. Where has that gone? And how much of it actually trickles down to women like myself and women who are in the villages. I think um, we skip around the issue. It's not really about empowering women. We're empowered. Um, we're empowering ourselves no matter what. Um, you know, with very little governmental support, we're starting businesses, we're raising our families. But what we want to know is that the monies go where, they go, where they're intended to go. Um, you know, again, I think even in the way that we relate, we either, whether it's in groupings, for example, um, uh, you know, one thing that sort of touches me is just the way that the questions are being asked and, you know, just the selection of who gets to ask questions. And I'd like to put this to the moderator. Um, in terms of you saying, no, a man and a woman, I think you should leave it to the woman to decide who to ask the questions to. I think, um, you know, again, that's about privilege, um, and you need to be able to recognize that in a space where there's women um, being a man, it should be open to anybody who puts their hands up first to, put their, to answer the question. So I just wanted to put that, I think we need to be conscious in the way that we hold space for women, and also just for women leadership. We don't need to be empowered. What we need is a government and a leadership that's accountable, that holds us as 
equal and not just about equity, but actually about social justice. We've been talking for so long about policies and so on. What we really need to see is hands-on action. We know what to do as women, okay. um, but we need to be able to do it. Yeah, thank you very much. Noted. Okay, um, we can give the um, panelists to answer these questions. Then we have the second set. Um, thank you, um, everybody, for um, these very, very important questions that uh, have been asked. I'll first start with my sister, Binta, on um, some of the issues you raised. To some extent, I do agree with you. And um, one of the things I observed when I was in this room was that I think I am in a meeting rarely organized like this in this country in a meeting where we, the men, form the minority. And um, it's kind of a little bit strange because most of the time we say, where are the women? Where are the women? And, and this is sort of like a culture in this country. You're talking of, OK, at the OP, we need to set the example. But let me tell you, I mean, at OP ourselves, when I came back into this country, one of the things I'm doing is helping to rebuild policy capacity at the level of the office of the president, you know, setting up or revamping the, what was used to be the policy analysis unit. But in our own experience has been that the initial recruitment, there was no woman. And then, or there was no female. And then this observation had to be made and they had to make specific efforts to ensure that there are women who are part of this. I think, in general, men are just blind to this issue of gender representation. Normally, when we talk about things, you know, really it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't occur to them. I see always, maybe I am different, because I, mean, I am fortunate to have all my kids are female. And I always say, as far as the next generation is concerned, I don't care what happens to the men. My concern is the women, because my children are girls. Maybe this is why I think differently. But many, I mean, this is a problem in this country. You have to bring it to the attention of people. Where are the women? They say, sort of, oh, okay. You know, but it is, I think it needs a cultural shift. Policies cannot address this. Well, policies can help, but it is the it, people who've got to realize that, yes, you need, I mean, women's representation in, in, in these things. So I do very much agree with you. Now, on the issue of energy, yes, affordability is key. This is why we have to look at different policy options. First, it is accessibility. You have to expand it and make sure that people have access to it. And then now you also need to look at affordability. Are people, can people afford it? This is why there's this issue of looking at the issue of willingness to pay. But I mean, in fact, looking at the initial things that are coming out of the data, it is surprising that people are ready to pay for electricity. They just say, let's have it, because we know we can make money. As you say, I mean, a lot of women entrepreneurs do come up once energy is up, I mean, uh, available. So uh, we, we need to make that um, definitely affordable. Now, uh, let me come to this young lady on the issue of, um, the issue of corruption and lack of accountability. I very much agree with you. This is a very big problem in this country. One of the things we are trying to get established at the office of the president is what we call a delivery unit, where people will be made accountable. We have lots of projects, millions of dollars going into projects in this country, which are loans that you and I and our children and our great-grandchildren have to pay back, and we are not seeing the effect of all these millions going into the various sectors. So we're trying to establish a delivery unit where people will be made accountable for whatever they are doing. But then, of course, again, it is back to the people. A lot of people are throwing spanners into the works we are doing. I wouldn't mention the ministry, but we have been engaged in some ministry and some projects to say, OK, let's identify key activities you're supposed to be doing and then we are going to monitor your delivery on a monthly or quarterly basis. The first thing they did was go through their minister and report us to the president that we are doing this thing, this, that, that, and that. And, you know, we, 
may actually go out of existence because people don't like to be held accountable. And this is a very big problem in this country. If, I mean, as the gentleman at the back had said, $45 million signed to do certain things on behalf of the people of the Gambia, these monies are going to be paid back. But at the end of the day, if nothing is realized, then the problem we are living a burden with our children and our great-grandchildren. And I think it is high time that we really look at ourselves and hold ourselves accountable. Accountability is something that everybody talks about. We want accountability, but in all honesty, nobody wants to be accountable. Seven million dollars, um, um, Mr. Jone. Thank you very much for um, <laughs> that question. Um, it's really important that you ask about our participation in the whole process. Um, but I think uh, what is important to note here is that um, 47 million made, you know, set aside for the empowerment of women. I think um, that should be implemented by the Ministry of Women's Affairs instead of the National Assembly. Um, most of the times, um, things like this do happen. You are not part of the initiation, you are not part of the development, but you know you are called to do the validation. And um, I don't know, we have a ministry. Uh, I don't want to say more, dilate much about this. Um, but all I can say is that um, this is something we need to look at. Are you aware? Um, are you aware? Are you um, aware of this? Personally, no. No, in, in your institution, are you? Uh, maybe um, everything went through the ministry. That's why I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Because we have a ministry. Um, maybe the ministry was involved. Okay. But I don't want to talk about that. Okay. Um, I just want to s add um, a little to what Palo said about um, corruption accountability. Um, I think in as much as we want to blame government for not doing something about corruption, which I don't believe in, we are doing something, government is doing something. But it's also important to look at ourselves. What are we doing as individuals? You don't want to be corrupt. I think um, we need discipline within ourselves. That is where it all starts. You're given a task, you took it, you, you took it with whatever remuneration there is, you took it with that and you accepted it. So you cannot come back and say, because I don't have much, I have to resort to corruption. Okay. I think we should be <coughs> able to be accountable to ourselves first before we ask government. That's what I wanted to add to that. Thank you. Um, probably I forgot to say, uh, maybe some people are taking notes, um, whosoever is uh, asking, you can just mention your name and the institution you are representing. Um, I will take, uh, wow. Okay, um, I will take Madam Hannah Foster, um, maybe Omar Danso, um, Lala and Sukai. And who, again? Fatu. Okay, Fatu. Probably we can say four. Huh? I mentioned four people. Huh? Okay. Can we start with uh, Madam Hana, please? Can you mention your name kindly, please? And your institution. It's not working? Okay. Hello? Can you okay. hear me? Okay. Thank you. I, I just want to um, ask two questions. One, uh, we know that we do have brilliant policies, uh, brilliant laws, uh, yet practice is something that we dream about. How do we ensure, or how does um, the government ensure that policy and practice are brought to the fore? Because uh, you have a for example, when we look at uh, the issue of women, even in the um, Constitution, there is no law stopping women from presenting themselves f 
And uh, when you also look at the policies, um, when we talk about human rights, when we talk about women's uh, personal law, you know, th there are brilliant uh, presentations, brilliant um, provisions. Yet, there is a huge gap when you talk about policy or uh, uh, practice and implementation. How do we together address this shortcoming? Two, the issue of affirmative action uh, is critical. And uh, when we also look at polit political party manifestos, the studies that I, um, that I highlighted, you find out that yes, there are women's wings, there are all these other um, uh, formations that have been put into these political parties. But how have they been used to ensure that this quota that everybody is talking about, that the Women's Act has even made provision for, how do we ensure that uh, women benefit from that? Thank you. And I wish to also um, disagree with uh, one of the speakers that uh, mentioned that there is no need for women's empowerment. There is need for women's empowerment because we are not at the same level. Some of us are privileged, you know, but then when you go to the grassroots and see how our women folk, how our other sisters live on the other side, there is need for empowerment. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Lala. Give Lala the mic, please. Lala, then Omar. Um, thank you, Mohammed. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would just like to say... Name I'd, and institution. Oh, my name is Lala Ture. I work for the TRRC, but I am here in my capacity as the country coordinator for the Gender Center of Empowering and Development. Um, I'd just like to say that it says a lot if an organization or an institution as important as the Women's Bureau is not informed or is not aware of a loan that is being processed or has been taken on behalf of Gambian women and who, is, who are the women that are going to benefit from that loan, what processes or mechanisms are in place to make sure that the money reaches the woman, woman that it is supposed to reach to and how it is going to be implemented. It says a lot if the Women's Bureau does not know about such a process. And I would want to know who are the women in the Gambia who are empowered. What do we mean when we say women empowerment? Is empowerment having women running behind politicians, campaigning for them, dancing for them, cooking for them, clapping for them during political campaigns? What is women empowerment? Is women empowerment having women rally behind a president when he's doing his rallies around the country? What is women empowerment? We need to redefine what we, women empowerment, because for the longest time, we've had governments, ministries talking about women empowerment, this women empowerment, that we've had policies, we've had laws, but who are the women in the Gambia who are empowered? Who? Okay, thank you. And, oh, sorry. Um, just last week, two days ago, we saw a private in, an individual, a citizen, launch a project in Kiang Quinala, Ajikumba Dafe. And this project goes a long way in making sure that women have access and women can um, venture into agricultural production without any of, with little or no challenges. Right? And I also like to touch on women political participation. For the longest time in this country, since the introduction of voting rights in 1942 in this country, women have participated. But what do they say? Our founding fathers. Who are our founding mothers? What happened to the women who had to go, through, had to, go to their farms, farm granite, produce it into peanuts, sell it, and give their money to men to fight for our independence? Who is talking about them? what happened to them in our history books. Thank you. And also, one more thing. I would like, just like to wrap up. I yeah. don't know. I yeah. have just a Collection lot of things that I have to say. Yeah. Um, what is the Women's Bureau doing to work with political parties? What is your relationship working with political parties? Because we do realize that a lot of women, more than 50% of um, people who vote in our electoral pro process are women. And most of these women are registered members of political parties. And we've seen how affiliated women are to political parties. 
um, in this country. So what is the working relationship Women's Bureau has with these political parties to make sure that their represent or their affiliation or their participation does not just stop at campaigning and voting for men? Okay, Basically. thank you very much. Uh, the corrections are important. Um, Sukai Job and then Omar. Um, Sukai, and please can we be precise? I know there are a lot of things to discuss. Please, precise. Name, name, institution. My name is Job, uh, the manager and founder of Test of Mutual, representing Equus Federation, the Gambia chapter. Okay, my question here is, what kind of policies does government have for women entrepreneurs, uh, especially those who are not on the street rates or ICT? That's my question. Okay, what policy do you have for entrepreneurs? Yeah. Is that clear? And then Omar Danso. Omar, name and the institution, then we can have the final round of questions, if time permits us. Okay, thank you so much, the organizers, and also the moderator, and also the panelists. Um, I can see that you really understand what is happening currently in the country. You already know the problems in existence. So based on that, the first presenter, that is the advisor, spoke about the importance and the relevance of data and policy formulation. And the Women's Bureau also talked about policies. So my question is, what are we doing as a country or as an institution to make sure that these policies that we are formulating reflect and also represent the marginalized women in our society? Someone made mention of it. What about those women who don't have access to education? What about those women who are not privy to our urban setup? So these are people that need to be represented. And this also reflect back to Jonas' question. That is, if the Women's Bureau is not aware or are not involved in the um, grant that the country just got, that's the loan, thank you. Um, then what does, where does that left the marginalized women? It's a grant and a loan. Uh, Omar, can you please your name and okay. the institution, please? Um, I am Omar Ranso from Activist Study Gambia. Okay, then we give chance to the panelists, please. Then we have maybe one or two questions. The questions are. <laughs> okay. um, thank you once again, moderator, and um, thanks to everybody. I think um, it's becoming more and more interesting. Now, there are lots of issues or lots of questions asked regarding the issue of policies. And let me say this. During the 22 years of the Jammeh rule, of course, there was almost a complete erosion of policy capacity within government or at the center of government. Now, our development partners realized this, government realized it, and therefore, as a result, our starting point, which is one of the reasons why I am there, was to rebuild policy capacity at that level. Now, as we know, there's what is called the policy process. And the policy process is cyclical in nature. It starts from formulation to implementation, monitoring and review, and then the process starts again. There are a number of issues we are faced with in this country as far as what we call coherence of policies are concerned, as far as synergy of policies are concerned, and this is where we have a very, very big problem. As I said at the beginning, policy formulation, policy implementation, you can have the most the fantastic policies, but if they are not properly implemented, if they are not financed, then it's as good as not having it. I have a planning background, and one of the things we talk about is that a plan and a policy is as good as the resources available to implement them. If you have fantastic policies, you don't put in place the necessary implementation frameworks to implement these policies. 
you didn't put in place the necessary financing required to implement these policies, then at the end of the day, it comes to nothing. And that's what's the general practice in this country, many, many uh, sectors we've been to. We have a policy, it's five years, we are going to review the, po we are going to formulate another policy. Do you take time to review that policy? Look at what has been implemented, what has been realized, what has not been realized, what are the challenges, what are the good things that you have done that you are able to build on in order to do the next policy. And right now we, we did what is called a policy mapping. Look at existing policies in every sector in this country. Where are you on this policy? What has been implemented? What are the successes? What are the failures? But a lot of people are just going through the cycle. We have a five-year policy, and we'll come to the end of our policy, we are going to formulate another one without necessarily critically reviewing what has been achieved. Now, unless we take time, unless, again, attitudinal change in this country, let us do things based on concrete data and concrete information rather than just doing uh, things because we have to do them. Now, there's also, there's also been this issue of the question of women's empowerment. And I'd like, um, uh, Lala, your issue of what is women's empowerment. And I agree with you. We need to really define what women's empowerment is. But there are two things that are critical for women's empowerment, which is the issue of capacity and confidence. A lot of people or a lot of women may want to engage but do they have the capacity to engage? Do they have the confidence to engage? And this is something we really need to work on, both for women and for youths in this country. If you want effective engagement, you have to have the capacity to engage. Like I always you know, joke with my civil society friends when I was at the UN, you clamor for a seat on the table, but make sure you don't come to the table empty-handed. When you come to the table, bring something that adds value to what we are doing, in addition to having the confidence and being able to, uh, to, to participate. So I believe these are issues that we need to continue discussing. At the level of government, we do realize the very big problem we have with our policies. We do formulate policies in isolation. We do work in silos. But a more important issue is the implementation of those policies. Normally, when you go through the policy process, there is a process it goes through, um, through cabinet, through the National Assembly, then you have the legislative and legal frameworks for its implementation, etc. There are many, many institutions in this country who have their draft policies in draft from the time they are formulated to the end of that policy. It never goes through the cycle. And it's just like down there, gathering dust. So I agree with you, Ada, very much. Policy implementation is key to this country. And if you want to make progress, we've got to be, make sure that we, we change the practice. Um, on the issue of entrepreneurship policy, I, th I think I would leave that to her um, in, in terms of uh, what are the uh, entrepreneurship policies that are existing. But then this cuts across a number of sectors. They are part of the trade policies, you know, within the Ministry of Trade. They are also part of the policies within the uh, Ministry for Women's Affairs. So I'll actually leave her to uh, talk about that. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, first, um, Lala, you ask about who is empowered, who is an empowered woman. You are one of them. <laughs> Lala, you are one of them um, because um, you know you are able to use your agency to make informed decisions and transform those decisions to desired outcomes. You know, when once a woman is denied the ability to make decisions, that is where poverty starts. You are poor. The woman is poor in all aspects, even an individual who doesn't have the capacity to make decisions, is um, denied of everything in this life. So um, empowerment involves a lot of things. But the most critical aspect of empowerment is to be able to make critical decisions that affect your life, and you use those decisions to transform them into desired outcomes for yourself, for your society, for your family. Um, we cannot say this is a specific definition for empowerment, 
but that is one aspect and the government can help in all aspects. The private sector can help and the NGOs can help in those directions. When it comes to policies, we at the Ministry of Women's Affairs, the Women's Bureau, our role is not to be implementing policy decisions. Our role is to assess what are the issues affecting men and women. We know women and men have different needs, but other policy actions from different partners also affect men and women differently. And our role is to find out those issues. We come up with uh, policy um, directions for agriculture, for health, for education, for environment, for energy, you name them. And then, whatever concerns agriculture that is in the uh, gender policy will be implemented by the Department of Agriculture or the Ministry of Agriculture. Now our role is to come up with a monitoring and evaluation framework to ensure that these uh, provisions that are in the gender policy are really mainstream into the agriculture policy so that um, when they mainstream, the budgets are allocated for them to be implemented and then we ensure that they implemented. If they are not implemented, we know why they were not being able to implement certain decisions. So that is our role. For entrepreneurship, I think um, the Ministry of Trade, um, the former PS is here. They have um, very progressive, um, recently have very progressive um, policies on entrepreneurship, which has adequately mainstream gender. And you know, out of that, a lot of actions have come out. Um, presently, the Women's Bureau is about to start implementing a fund for women called the Enterprise Fund for Women. And part of that is being uh, funded from the, the European Union grant to the government of the Gambia, and also partly funded by the government of the Gambia. Um, for five years as of now, the government of the Gambia is giving us six million dollars, and we are having um, three million um, euros from the European Union grant, which will spread over the period of three years. So for entrepreneurship, we're doing a lot. A lot of um, um, trainings are being conducted. We have our partners. I said we are not implementing directly, but we have our partners here. We have GAIPA, we have uh, Chamber of Commerce, and now you will um, just um, join me to congratulate uh, the former permanent secretary of the Ministry of Trade who has established um, the Women Chamber of Commerce. And I think we need to applaud her for that. Can we give her a round of applause? <laughs> so these are some of the things that we need from our partners. You don't have to wait and ask what is government doing for women. Government has the policies. We have beautiful policies. But the implementation is not the responsibility of government alone. It's the responsibility of all and sundry. And we need to ensure that um, we all participate in the implementation of these policies. We don't have the time to talk about all these issues. I'm sure many of such um, forums um, will be organized and then we will have time to talk about issues affecting women. Let me just talk about the, the issue of uh, Women's Bureau not I did not say Women's Bureau is not involved. I didn't say that. We now have a ministry. So, you know, things could go through the ministry and it's ministered to somebody and uh, I am not aware, but I'm sure the ministry is aware. But what I'm saying is, these are issues. This $47 million is to women's group should come through the Ministry of Women's Affairs. The National Assembly should delegate that responsibility to the Ministry of Women's Affairs and not implement that directly. Um, I think the National Assembly is not implementing it. It went to the National Assembly for ratification. Uh, the, yeah, so probably the question. From which um, uh, is the Minister of Finance that uh, brought the uh, grant before the National Assembly members. So the grant is specifically for enhancing women agriculture and other, among other things. So it is a loan and a grant. Yeah, so it is not implemented by the National Assembly. It is 
there to be ratified. Million. I'm not aware of anything okay. like that. Okay, thank but you. We take of this grant, even uh -huh. this three million I'm talking about, uh -huh. is part of that grant. Of course, uh, if it is that grant you're talking about, okay, yeah, it's we, already yeah, yeah, at, we are okay. Aware, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two question, uh, questions. Alaji Nyang and uh, the lady there. Uh, okay, uh, you can ask, yeah, okay. then after Alaji. Then, if time permits us, I can give. Okay, Fat Samba. Okay, and Fat Samba. Okay, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Kuba yeah. Dafika, president of the Treasure Women Warriors. Um, I just wanted to um, elaborate on the issue of coming to the table. You know, when we're talking about bringing uh, what we women bring to the table, you have to bring the right women to the table. But if you don't bring the right women to the table, how do we expect uh, for women, we talk about women empowerment and to deal with women issues. Um, you talked about um, Lala being empowered. How I see things, if the women, the majority of women in this country are not empowered, I don't care how, a few, uh, how much a few of the women are empowered, it's not impactful. When we talk about women empowerment, we have to look across the board. And it has to be a brush, brush stroke that we brush all, all, all across. You know, when I first came to the country to work with women in this country, capacity building was one of the, the rave for the last 10 years, everybody capacity building. A lot of money came into this country for capacity building. When we went to the ground to work with women, there was zero capacity. And there was a lot of money that was actually pumped into this country, a lot of training that went into capacity building, and these women that were capacitized, zero capacity. So I was talking to somebody, I said, most of these projects that we have for women, we have not been fair to Gambian women. Most of these projects have not been fair to Gambian women, the way they've been implemented without the sustainability aspect of it. So these are things that we need to start looking at this country. Women in this country are not poor. They are not poor. I want to say that. I know these women. Thank you. Because when you talk about poverty, Thank you're talking about poverty of the, of the mind, the soul, and all that stuff. They've been deprived, and they've been deprived by the people that were responsible to uplift them. They've been deprived by women who were supposed to stand for them. Women that are in, in positions that were supposed to stand for these women that did not stand for them. So if I did not say that here today, a lot of women that are in position failed women in this country. And we have to be, we, have, we, we as women need to take responsibility for how much we have failed our women, particularly the women in the grassroots level. This upsets me. This upset, they are not poor. They were marginalized, and most of them were marginalized by women like us. Okay. Uh, thank you. Alaji Nyang. Alaji. Alaji is there. Alaji. Please, your name, institution, and then please be precise, please. Okay. You've already said my name. Uh, my name is Alaji S. Nyang. Uh, I'm coming from Activista. Uh, anyway, I have three questions, but very precise questions. Uh, first, uh, just to talk about uh, issues that are happening, particularly affecting rural women, is the increasing impact of climate change. I just want to know what are the mechanisms in place to ensure uh, that the resilience and the adaptability of rural women are built. The second question talks about also uh, women, and particularly those in the rural communities. We do understand that about 70% of food production in the Gambia are being done by women, notwithstanding little, very little, or most women don't have access, control, and ownership over land. I want to know what are the processes in place by government to ensure there is a national policy on land that guarantee the access, control, and ownership of women uh, uh, to, to, to have land. Okay. The third question talks about uh, peace. You know, we said uh, peace, co there is peace, human rights, and development, and these three things need to go together. And we understand women contribute immensely when it comes to, uh, when it comes to peace building and, uh, in the country. 
uh, in all the district in the country, we have what they call the district tribunals. And I only know of only two district tribunals that have women representatives there. So I want to know what the Women Bureau is doing and other government agencies to ensure so women are included in all district tribunals because that's where mostly cases of, for example, conflict relating to land and commu at the community level are discussed. And most of the district tribunals, I know of only two, two district tribunals that have women representatives. Okay. Um, thank you. Then the last Fatu. Uh, Fatu Samba. Samba. Fatu Samba. Uh, before then, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Lord Mayor of Banjo, uh, Madam Rohilo. You're welcome. Finally, thank you very much for giving me the mic. No problem, sir. I am uh, my name is Fatu Samba. I am representing the National Women Farmers Association. I think uh, most of the speakers spoke for us, uh, the national women farmers, who are the most vulnerable and the least educated. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, my first question is about asking whether gender equality and uh, democracy is included in the curriculum of the schools. Having said that, I think uh, that would help the, the male and the female child to be able to develop themselves on, on those topics before they grow up. Uh, secondly, I would uh, want to talk about the role of the women farmers in the Gambia. Of course, we know they are the producers and they produce a lot and uh, I don't agree with the last speaker, the female who said they're not getting anything. They're getting something. I think right now where I'm sitting, some women have 11 million dollars in their accounts. That is different from their own accounts. Okay. I think they are gaining a momentum. Uh, what I want to ask is, they are producing, but marketing is a problem. They produce, they sell, they eat, but where do they sell? They take their pines, spread it on the ground, and sell the whole day and any end up giving it selling it at a giveaway price. What is the government of the Gambia doing on that? Thank you. Especially looking at the ECOWAS policy, you are saying free movement of goods and services with our neighboring Senegal. These women cannot carry anything to the border of Senegal to go and sell or sell the produces they have Thank in you. their households. Okay. Uh, thank thank you, you. Because you gave it to me late, so thank you. Okay, uh, then Madam Nafi Bari want to say something uh, before we wrap up. The the please, Madam Nafi. I think uh, it's important we give her the chance. Sorry, we would have to close the, with her. Yes, so yes, obviously, yes. Then um, I will give you a chance to wrap up as well. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, I, I think it would be a missed opportunity if we don't talk about policy. Closer, closer, closer. Yeah. I think it representation should be covered by um, the, can I have it? the uh, policy that we have. What is happening to policy? How do we ensure that the policies that we um, have in this country are gender sensitive? I know, where, what are the checks and balances? I've just heard Selin Palu talk about the processes that it goes through. Who in those institutions uh, can apply the gender lens in trying to find out whether these are gender specific uh, we have a gender uh, policy, but that policy is not broad enough. It cannot take on all the sectors. What we expect is that from the sectoral level, we have gender uh, 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 responsive uh, policies. But who amongst the lot that we've just talked about would ensure that this happens? Is there a process wherein there's a policy analysis unit at State House? Does it go through them? Does it go through the... Um, Ministry of Women's Affairs, which was recently, I know there used to be some gender focal points that were trained 
into looking at, but even at that, it wasn't possible. I think if we are serious about having gender responsive policies, we need to put in place a mechanism that would ensure that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Briefly, um, Mr. Advisor and then Madam Director. Uh, before we do that, can I use my privilege to give her just a few seconds, five seconds, to ask the final question? No, she begged. Five seconds. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Mine is a question and a concern. I've just noticed that we have a lot of women groups, women association councils, that have been advocating for women's development issues and all those things. But my concern is, how have we been supporting each other? Because I've noticed that there's a lot of infighting between these groups, conflicts, you know? How can we address those conflicts amongst ourselves to support each other, to be each other's keeper, so that at least we can move forward? This has been a long-standing issue. I think that is one of the main reasons why we are not moving out forward. How can we be united in one voice to make sure that we speak one voice and move ahead? And then the second thing is we've been having males as president for so many years and then they've not been moving forward. Is it not time for us, the women, to take the mantle and then push them out and move this country forward? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, let me just quickly try to respond to some of the issues that are raised, starting first with Kumba on the issue of getting a seat on the table and this whole issue of empowerment. Now, there are three fundamental issues, at, or I would say prerequisites, that you need for effective participation if you have a seat on the table. The first is information. You've got to have the information. If you don't have the information, you cannot be part of what is going on. So information sharing on the part of those who have it and also making an attempt to make sure that you are informed is critical for empowerment and for effective participation. The second thing is the issue of capacity and your ability to participate. You must have that capacity, whether it is knowledge, whether it is financial or whatever, but you need to have that. And the third and most important thing is what we call the confidence and willingness to participate. And this is one of the big problems we have, particularly with women. Do they have the confidence? Are they willing to take on the status quo? I remember at one time, talk, I mean, working with um, somebody who was at the Women's Bureau, and it was 4 o'clock, and they said, hey, be take it of course, yes, you need to do it. But if you take that as the most important thing, I mean, I am a man. When I get home, I mean, I dish out for myself. I don't need to wait for my wife to do that for me. But if the woman sees it has her responsibility and has to leave whatever she's doing to go and serve her husband, I think you, the woman, you still have a problem. I am not advocating for divorces or whatever, but I think it's just the approach that we need to. You cannot be advocating for women's equality, women's empowerment on one hand, and then you want to be a sort of like a slave when you go home. It is unacceptable. And I think, you know, this is something we really have to, you have to have the confidence and the willingness to take on the status quo. So these are three important things. Now, of course, the issue of poverty is very, very critical, and there are many dimensions to poverty. Deprivation and marginalization are causes of poverty. They are consequences of poverty, conflict, as well as instability. So all this, as I keep saying, we need to look at this development um, uh, the, the nexus between development, uh, human rights, and, and peace if we need to address this. Now, somebody asked on the issue of climate change. Yes, of course, climate change is a very critical thing, and it is amongst the priorities of government to ensure that climate change is addressed. We know the mandate of the Ministry of Environment has recently been um, changed to include climate change. They have a primary mandate to address issues of climate change, whether it is, I mean, about adaptation or enhancing uh, or ensuring that communities are resilient to climate change, including the availability of data, putting in place monitoring systems. Um, I, I think there are, I mean, recent things that have been done up country to make sure that we are able to get adequate data to enhance our status of preparedness. 
for, uh, for uh, issues related to climate change. Somebody talked about the issue of land ownership and land policies and how this is affecting women. Let me say this. The primary cause of land conflicts in this country is because of lack of policies. As I said, we did a policy mapping sometime when we were starting this whole process of rebuilding the policy capacity in the office of the president. And let me say one thing. The only land policy ever existing in this country was done in 1959. That's the last only one and only land policy we have in this country. So you could see the problem. And that policy at the time covered what was called the protectorate, which was Banjul or till Kumbu South. So out of the, the outer, outside of these two geographic areas, there is nothing, nothing absolutely. So there's always the conflict between um, the, what government tries to do and customary and land tenure system. This is why we have all these conflicts. So if we have to address the issues of land in this country, the first thing is to look at the policy, which actually doesn't exist, not to talk of policies affecting women. There is the Lands Commission, but I always call it a firefighting institution. They are there to look at conflicts about land, but addressing the fundamental issue of land is a priority, matter of priority for this country. Of course, there are all these acts and other things, but a policy on land. People are changing agricultural land to, come, uh, to uh, residential lands, and there is no policy guiding this. We see conflicts between, um, what is it called again, the tourism authority and communities in Combo, and that is because a policy doesn't exist. They say customarily it is our land, but then there is an act that, or, or, that gives the tourism authority rights over land that they call the tourism development area. So there are all these conflicts because a policy doesn't exist. And I always say the issue of land is a ticking time bomb. If it is not addressed, it will explode. And when it explodes, it's going to be very, very um, serious. Now, finally, um, coming to Nafi, your question on the issue of policy formulation. Yes, as I said, we are trying to rebuild policy capacity in the office of the president. Re um, sort of reformulate what used to be the policy analysis unit into what we now call the Department for Strategic Policy Delivery and Coordination. And our primary reason why we exist is to support the policy process at the level of the sectors. We say any sector that is developing a policy, let us be aware so that we serve as the watchdog to make sure that, for instance, right now we are working with the ANR sector on their policy. Because I mean, those of you from agriculture, we know what is the problem with the ANR, the, the ANR policy. ANR used to be one ministry, agriculture and natural resources. Today, that ministry has been broken down into three or four ministries. You have the Ministry of Agriculture, which is agriculture and livestock. You have the Ministry of Water Resources and Fisheries. You have the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. You have the National Environment Agency, etc. So is it feasible? Or does it make sense to still have an ANR policy cutting across all these ministries? And this is why we have the problem, because the other people feel that the ANR policy is very much agriculture dominated. So somebody has to play that role of making sure that, I mean, all the players who are supposed to be part of the policy are being part of the policy. So it's actually supporting sectors to make sure that the policy formulation process is done in the right way, but then also bringing in others, like we tried we try to have a gender focal person there, somebody who is a gender specialist that ensures that all these policies are gender uh, sensitive, but at the same time also we make sure if we see the Minister for Women's Affairs is not part of it, we bring them in and make sure that they are part of the policy process. So this is what we are trying to do, but again I say it is very, very difficult. As I said with the issue of corruption, it's the same with the issue of coordination. Everybody cries about coordination. Everybody talks about coordination, but nobody wants to be coordinated. If you attempt to coordinate, they see you as meddling into what they are doing. And this is our biggest problem. 
you know, when you go into agriculture, you know, this is our area, we are the experts, leave us. You people are meddling into what you are doing. The same in education, the same in other things, and we all need to work together. Government is like the body. Every part is required. The hand needs the eye, the eye needs the head, the head needs the, the toes and everything. And this is what government is all about. No sector can do anything you are doing in the absence of the other sector. And the earlier we realize this and be willing to work together, the better for this country. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Njai. Um, uh, briefly, I just want to go back to one of the questions that was asked about women's bureaus engagement with political parties, whether we do engage with them. And um, I forgot to talk about that. Yes, we do. And recently, we, we, went, we were working with all political parties to ensure that political parties involve women at the level of decision making, not just as um, committee members or the executives, but at the highest level of decision making as um, uh, executive members of the political parties, not just like vice, uh, I don't know how do you call it, but uh, they're always deputies in most of the uh, political parties. So we have developed um, standard uh, SOPs with them, standard operating procedures, procedures with all the political parties, and, and now they have been, uh, all of them, we're going around to validate the, 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 the procedures they have developed so that they, they, they agree that this is what they agreed to do for women. And a lot of advocacy is also going on to ensure that women are involved in the decision making process of all political parties. We have done that. And we have also, uh, in, with regards to the district tribunals, um, this is under the Ministry of um, Local Government, and we have engaged the different ministers who have been there mm -hmm. that, you know, we need to ensure that women are part of the district tribunals. And thank God, that is the, w that is the reason why we have even the two we have now. And, you know, we will continue the advocacy because our role is to advocate, to sensitize the people, to know the, the, the essence of women participation at those levels. Um, for the issue of um, saying uh, that women have zero capacity, I don't think I will ever agree with that. Since 1995, we have the likes of Binta Jame Sidibes. We have all these people here. The fact that you were able to go, I'm sorry, I cannot remember the name. Kumba, uh, the fact that Kumba, you were able to go that far in the rural areas and they were able to come out and tell you that we don't have the capacity. That alone is capacity for them. And I know, yeah, it's capacity to be able to come out and tell you that. that that's, the, that's what we're doing, the right-based approach. Whether they can remember what they have learned or they can come back and say we are doing this, we are doing that, that's another thing. But the fact that they are able to come out, women, we are not doing that. You, you talk to them, no. It's the men that they ask you to go and talk to, not them. And now we have seen women coming out to, 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 to voice out their problems. That alone is a, its capacity. So um, I don't know. The, the Ministry of Agriculture is doing a lot. The Ministry of Health is doing a lot. All these extension officers, all extension workers, at our level, what we are doing is, okay, we know that um, at the level uh, of the grassroots, extension workers need to know how to mainstream gender how to do gender responsive budgeting and we build their capacity in that regard. And we work with the Ministry of Agriculture. We went around the country, all the extension officers. Um, well, we cannot get all at the same time, but most of the extension officers in the provinces throughout the country, Sajo can be my witness. We train them on gender responsive budgeting, gender analysis. How do we do you do a gender responsive planning? And it's also the responsibility of us all to share information. Maybe we cannot uh, engage people individually at household level, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of people have done a great job, mm -hmm. starting from the former vice president, Binta Jami, since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. You know, work has been done in empowering okay. women, so we cannot say there is zero okay. capacity. We have challenges, and we all know the challenges are mostly cultural issues, they are also economic issues which we are all facing. Thank so, you. So um, we will continue to work on 
You know, we will, we will continue to work on ensuring that women have the right information, they have the right capacity, and uh, we ensure that they're able okay. to participate yeah. effectively. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you. I you know. Just stop me. We'll I, I just want to yeah, talk about briefly, that. then you wrap briefly up. Briefly about that, the, uh, the yeah, gender wrap responsive up, wrap up, policies. Yeah. I entirely agree with um, PS on that. Mm -hmm. We have a gender focal points in each institution mm -hmm. as part of the gender machinery. But usually what happens, you write to institutions, mm -hmm. identify a gender focal point at senior management level, sometimes they bring you a secretary who doesn't take part in decision making. Mm -hmm. She is not there when you have your senior staff meetings. She is not there to, um, to be able to raise the issues of concerns of women in your sector. So how do you expect uh, that person to mainstream gender in your policies? That, that is one of the issues that is affecting them. But one important thing is um, at the level of the policy analysis unit, I think it's important you have a gender focal point who will be reviewing all policies and ensure that each policy that comes through you cannot pass without a gender po objective. Okay, all policies you. need to have a gender objective Focus. and they should be budgeted for. Thank you. Yeah, yeah uh, think, uh, our recommendation. Uh, to you. So finally, what do you say, Virata? No, have him. You, you uh, okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, as a way of wrapping up, um, one, uh, one thing I want to this say is, is I think this is a very, very important forum. And uh, for me, from where I'm sitting, I believe it's a blessing in disguise. In the sense that there's an initiative we're trying to do with the UN system called Citizen State Engagement to strengthen inclusive um, citizen engagement for accountability. Now, what we are trying to do here is to ensure that there's improved governance and transparency and accountability for national development matters. And we are trying to bring about an exchange between public leadership and the uh, public to engage on the issue of policies. A lot of you have talked about policies here. And what we are trying to do is to create a national platform for dialogue and transformative communication between governments and citizens. And this is an integral part of it. So look out for the information. Very soon, we're going to send this out, and we're going to be organizing what we call town halls, because we want to make government accountable. When we talk about the performance of sectors, it is not you know, coming out with and say, oh, we hired a consultant, and here is our evaluation report. What we want now to see is for citizens to tell us how have these agricultural projects benefited them? As we are saying, this 45 or 47 million dollars. At the end of the day, we want citizens themselves to tell us have these projects that benefited us or not, and not the ministry responsible hiring a consultant coming from uh, outside, paid millions of dollars just to write a report that would gather dust in the cell. So we are engaging on the citizen, engage, citizen stage engagement platform and I want to urge all of you, the organizers, particularly, I mean, Buba and your team, please make sure that you are part of this process because we need the voices of the citizens. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, it was a painstaking discussion, you know, and interesting, definitely. Um, yeah, but time is not on our side. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Fallu, the advisor to the president, and then I would like to thank uh, the executive director, uh, Madam Gasama. Uh, please, can you give a round of applause to them, please? Yeah, so thank you very much. Now, everyone recommended that um, lip service, no more, we need actions. So it's time to act, not just to commit yourself through lip service. Women issues are very important. I was your host, Mohamed Bah. Thank you so much for having me. Can we give a very big round of applause again to our panelists, Ms. Sanjay, Madam Gassama, and our brilliant moderator, Mohamed Espa. Thank you so much. I don't know about you guys. But I know that if you have been to a family meeting, you know that there is never an occasion where we have the most honest discussions. 
uh, at such a gathering. And you know that discussions are also not, not always. Uh, they do not always end. We have to suspend them and we resume on another time. And I hope that this is not going to be the last time that we meet to continue this conversation, that other platforms are going to be created where everyone would want to be heard on the issues that matter to them. Some people are hungry, I can see on your face. <laughs> we'll have that break, but before that, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, I told you before that we want to reach the, a bigger audience than this. And so if you're on Facebook and on Twitter, please hashtag sectors together, number four, prosperity. Sector, hashtag sectors together for prosperity. Another announcement that I want to make is there is a participant here who lost her wallet. And the wallet includes her car keys and other items. If you have seen it, I am told it's in black color. If anyone has seen it, please let us know so that we can hand over to her. The other announcement that I have to make is there are some of us here, young women, who have been invited to a dialogue. It is going to be during the break. Uh, we're going to be having our lunch at the same venue. The venue is downstairs room five. So if we can all gather here at the lobby and we move together to this room, that's where we'll be having our lunch while we have the conversation. I'm also told that there are people here who haven't registered yet. The, regist the uh, registration is still ongoing outside. That's where you register, and that's where we also pick our tickets for the drinks. Lunch has been served, I was told. It's outside on this side, I guess. So we can all go now to have our lunch, and when we return, we continue this conversation. We are all actors, we are all partners, we are all collaborators, and then we would have to explore what our specific roles are as individuals and collectively in ensuring democracy and inclusiveness uh, and the empowerment of women and children. Thank you so much for being here with us. Before I move on, um, I just realized that we have newcomers. We have uh, the mayor of Banju, Madam Rohi Maliklo, I would like to recognize your presence. There is a representative from the Vice President's office who is also here. I would like to recognize your presence as well. And we have a National Assembly representative, Yakumba Jaite, who is also with us. And we are very happy to have you to add your voice to this conversation. So now we can go for the lunch break and we will be back. Uh, maybe quarter past two. Quarter past two, we are back in the room to continue the program. Thank you so much. Them Alpha August, Beckham, them Pan. 